The world is looking to watch what happens in Pakistan next, a country that seems to be in internal turmoil, where all the three major institutions, the parliament, the judiciary and the military seem to be locked into some kind of mortal combat. As the politics in Pakistan unfolds, somebody who is being watched very closely, believed to have tapped into a mood of public discontent, is Imran Khan, who in his own words has said to us repeatedly that his time has now come. We are sitting here with Imran in his house in Islamabad. You have every reason to smile today, don't you? Uh, yes, uh, not just because my party is, is, is on the ascendant, yeah, and is is now the number one party and has the the biggest public support, but because I think our democracy has evolved in these entire crises, as you just mentioned in your opening remarks. What has come out is that the army is no longer prepared to come out in the open. The age of the coup is over, in a sense. Uh, the age of martial law is over. It's over, yeah. Because um, the Memogate scandal is, is such a shameful scandal that if ever the army would have intervened, it would have been then. Because it's effectively a president asking the United States to come and help uh, 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 him uh, get rid of the army hierarchy so that he could serve them better. That's in, in effect the memo gate. And normally, I mean, the army would have, that would have been enough to take over. Uh, I mean, as it is, it, 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 there's public outrage against that. And so you would have had the public backing. But Pakistan has moved on. And I think the army realizes now that people are not going to accept uh, military uh, takeovers anymore. At the same time, the Supreme Court I mean, the Supreme Court has taken a stand. Finally, the Supreme Court, for the first time in Pakistan, you're seeing uh, the court taking on the powerful. Normally, the Supreme Court has been part of the executive and taken orders from the government, literally. First time, the Supreme Court is now challenging the most powerful people in this country and challenging the, the corruption cases. And so we have a vibrant media, which is the third pillar, uh, uh, and we have a very politically aware public. But here's the catch in your argument, and that catch is that supporters of this government or sympathizers of this government and many liberal voices in Pakistan are saying this is a test case for democracy, that an elected government should be allowed to complete its tenure, and why is the opposition pushing for an early election? Well, it would, in normal circumstances, I would agree. But now what is this government trying to do? It's trying to demolish an independent Supreme Court. What is... Uh, is our early elections going to destroy our democracy? Or if the independent judiciary is destroyed, would that destroy our democracy? Surely the third world is third world because they do not have independent justice system. And criminals come into power to loot the country and they have no checks and balances. Pakistan, as I said, has moved on. First time we have an independent Supreme Court. Now, if this government takes on the Supreme Court just so, that it can protect Asif Zardari's corruption of billions of dollars. I'm afraid if, you stand, if people stand by the judiciary and it wins, our democracy wins. If our judiciary loses, our democracy loses. What do you say to those voices in your country who are suggesting that in some ways the judiciary and the military today are on the same side in this debate? I don't know if there's any indication of that, but all I know is that the Supreme Court has been very lenient with this government. I mean, these, this NR, the day the NRO was struck down, an NRO brokered by the Bush administration, which Condoleezza Rice writes in a book that she helped wave of all corruption cases of Benazir and 8,000 people. Corruption cases of over a trillion rupees they were waved, out, waved off. Would they do that in their own countries? Would they do this, uh, allow criminals given an amnesty and then allow them to contest elections and then the biggest crook becomes the president? Would they, they allow that? Their argument, of course, so, is these are political cases. They were acts of vendetta and you needed the amnesty to create a democracy movement. That's their argument. Absolute nonsense. They destroyed our democracy by that NRO election. Nowhere in the Western world would our criminals allowed to contest elections. These were not political cases. Asad Zadari's case was in the, uh, in the, in, in the Swiss, Swiss courts. He was already convicted. He was on appeal. All these cases were withdrawn, thanks to the Americans, because they wanted a puppet government here which would bomb its own people. 
And so they, when, when Musharraf was weakening, they got them together as Condoleezza Rice so shamefully but triumphantly says in a book. And so we got this crook, the government of crooks and the Supreme Court, whenever it challenged them, the government took, took, took the Supreme Court on. Almost making out if, if, you, if the Supreme Court took on the, 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 the crooked politicians, democracy was, was, was at stake. So in, the, in, in taking, hiding behind democracy, they kept looting the country. Never have we had so much corruption in this country as today. And so therefore, um, whoever says that the army is behind it, I think that uh, if anything, the Supreme Court has been very lenient because they allowed them to go on plundering this country. There's been one scam after another, and yet the country has helplessly been looking at the Supreme Court to take action, and this government has stonewalled the Supreme Court. So finally, the, government, uh, the Supreme Court has passed a contempt notice on the, on the Prime Minister, and everyone is watching. If the government tries to now uh, defy the Supreme Court, they won't know what hit them. Because my party and the, the tsunami will be in the streets and they won't be able to contain it. What about the fact that on the same day that the Prime Minister gets this contempt notice, he also wins a trust vote that asserts the supremacy of Parliament. Does that change the game? This Parliament is a coalition of crooks. They're elected. If you allow criminals to fight anywhere in the world, they'll get elected. The reason why democracies survive in the Western world is no criminal is allowed to contest elections. The papers are rejected. But if you allow criminals, if, if I am a criminal and I have amassed billions of rupees, how can a decent candidate compete against me? If I have uh, a criminal gangs with me holding Kleshnikovs, I terrorize everyone and get votes. So uh, a, a democracy only, only elections bring help democracy if there's rule of law. So when you have one law for the powerful crooks and the other for the common people, they're always going to get, uh, get into power. So this coalition of crooks, they've all got a, a, a share of the pie. They're all benefiting from this corrupt system while the country is suffering. Poor people are getting poorer. Never have we had so much poverty, unemployment, inflation, no gas, no electricity. And these guys are all sort of getting together to protect their... their, their Corruption. So no one, no one pays any attention to this parliament. I was just going to say that we're actually sitting here talking to you outside in this beautiful home because there is no electricity, even in Imran Khan's home. Why are politicians not talking about these issues? Why is it such a rhetorical campaign about everything else here in Pakistan except the economy? No, Barka, we do talk about it. I mean, we've had demonstrations uh, of electricity and gas shortages. Uh, but unfortunately, there's every day a new issue comes along. You wake up and there's another issue, another scam, you know, rental power scam. Then you wake up, then there's some fertilizer scam of billions of rupees. So therefore, you know, uh, you don't know what to concentrate. People were hoping that this government would finally leave. People are sick of this government and waiting for them to go. Uh, but this is, a, this is an issue, uh, uh, the, 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 what is in the Supreme Court. The whole country is now waiting, expecting the Supreme Court to dispense justice. Are you looking for an early election? Well, for our party, obviously, I mean, uh, if, the, if the government lasts or till the elections, it's, it's of great benefit to us because we're gaining every day. So you wouldn't want an early election? Well, from our point of view, I'm saying my Tariq and Saab point of view, but from Pakistan's point of view, the sooner the elections, the better. The sooner we get rid of this coalition of crooks, uh, the better we can start rebuilding this country. You don't buy the argument that this is about the supremacy of parliament and this is about preserving that democratic supremacy. Uh, in, a, in, in Pakistan's democracy is supremacy of the constitution. Parliament is sovereign but the constitution is supreme. So uh, what this government is doing is defying the constitution. By standing up to, by defying the orders of the Supreme Court, it is actually def uh, going against the constitution. In fact, it, there are about 18 judgments of the Supreme Court this government has defied so far. I want to ask you, there are those who say Imran Khan is being backed by the Pakistani army. I read this all the time in the Pakistani media. Well, this is what all the politicians are petrified of. Because they don't know what's happened. How come this tsunami has suddenly built up? Uh, but if the army has now helped us, then surely it must be uh, manipulating the Pew polls, which are American uh, opinion polls, where Tariq Ansaf has been number one now for six months. 
YouGov polls in England, there, there we've been number one. All the polls which are conducted in Pakistan, we are the number one party now. So surely they must be uh, manipulating that. And then a quarter of a million people turn up in, uh, in Lahore and a quarter of a million in Karachi. General Musharraf, when he was the head of the ISI and the army, he couldn't pull a, 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 a minuscule crowd compared to that. Forget about the passion in the crowd. Aren't they overestimating the army? General Musharraf, since you've mentioned him, is now looking to be part of your alliance. Well, unfortunately, I mean, it's kind of him to want to be part of our alliance, but we can't accept him simply because uh, the NRO, the reason why these criminals are sitting here, Asa Zardari, is because of General Musharraf. A deal brokered between him and, the when he, yeah. um, and secondly, the mess in Balochistan, assassination of Nawab Akbar Bukti. It's because of Musharraf. The Lal Masjid, where these the madrasa students were all incinerated, uh, and that's when really extremism arose in Pakistan. That they, all of that is blamed on him. And then the war on terror, where 40,000 people have died. How can we have an alliance with him? So you'll have nothing to do with him? Absolutely. Absolutely not, and I, I actually, my advice to him is he shouldn't come to Pakistan because his life would be in danger. Because Why the people who are, look at the, the Balochis, uh, uh, they've already, uh, uh, the son of Noab Akbar Bukti has already uh, put a ransom on Musharraf's head. And no, don't, mention, uh, don't forget the people in tribal areas who believe in blood vendettas, whose near and dear ones have been killed, they blame it on him. But you know, when I was interviewing him in London a couple of months ago, he said that you were the best of the available options, but he also said that Imran thinks that running Pakistan is like being the captain of a cricket team. Well, time will tell uh, whether uh, the captain of a cricket team does a better job with Pakistan or the army chief who took over and left this mess. So you'll have nothing to do with him? No, I, we cannot have any alliance with General Musharraf. Actually, we're, we have no plans of any alliances. We'll fight alone. But if you do not get the numbers, you will need help from somebody you may. Uh, I'm confident that, I, uh, you know, I've been saying this before, we'll sweep this election. Uh, I, and I'm confident because I know I'm amongst the people. People have changed. This is a new Pakistan. And the youth in Pakistan, which is 70% of the population, uh, they've already made up their minds. They're not making up their minds. They've made up their minds. Just go to any university college, you'll know where the youth stands. And youth and women are always in the forefront of change. And this is where Tariq and Saf is uh, way ahead of all the other parties. So why would we want an alliance with those parties which represent the status quo, which are, all of them are sitting in power, all of them have benefited from this uh, corrupt system, all, and most of the, uh, in fact, all the leaders have massive corruption cases against them. Why would I want an alliance with them? I'd much rather, if I don't get in the numbers, sit in the opposition and be a proper opposition in Pakistan, then form a coalition with these crooks. But tell me, what do you make of the very public spat between the civilian government and the military that began with the Memogate controversy? It's quite rare to see that in Pakistan. Well, but, but these are exceptional circumstances. I mean, look, at, as I said, I mean, the accusation uh, against Asa Zardari of having asked the Americans' help to get rid of the top military brass so that he could have his pliant officers there so, he, so that he could serve them better. Well, the, I mean, alleged, this is, the alleged memo says they feared a military takeover after Osama bin Laden was killed. Yeah, and that's why he wanted to get rid of the top brass. So, uh, would you be surprised, I mean, if, if the, the army was angry? The people are angry in Pakistan. Everyone in Pakistan thought this was, you know, to asking Americans to help them against the army. I mean, uh, it's, it's a treasonable case. It's interesting that you say that it's a treasonable case because the government here is planning to file treason charges against Mansoor Ijaz as and when he comes to Pakistan because they're saying that he's made statements in the past that, you know, he was responsible or involved in toppling Benazir Bhutto's government. Well, as I said, I, I'm just giving you what the case is. It's sub -judice. The Judicial Commission, which is now investigating, I don't know what comes out of it. But if the allegation is true, it is quite shocking and the army has a right to be angry. Were you, were you surprised that Mansoor Ijaz did not show up for his testimony? I, have, I do not have a very high opinion of Mansoor Ijaz. Um, 
you know, for me, he's a non-entity. I don't know why anyone took him seriously. But yet you believe the authenticity of the memo that he's claiming? No, I'm not saying that. You're not I'm saying, saying that. it's subjudice. Okay. I'm saying the allegation is very serious. Do you see this standoff? Because you said earlier that the age of an army takeover is over in Pakistan. Do you see the standoff subsiding? Uh, uh, no, I don't see. Whatever happens, I don't see a military takeover. Well, but, but these are exceptional circumstances. I mean, look at, as I said, I mean, the accusation uh, against Asa Zardari of having asked the Americans' help to get rid of the top military brass so that he could have his pliant officers there so, he, so that he could serve them better. Well, the, I mean, alleged, this is, the alleged memo says they feared a military takeover after Osama bin Laden was killed. Yeah, and that's why he wanted to get rid of the top brass. So... Uh, would you be surprised, I mean, if, if the, the army was angry? The people are angry in Pakistan. Everyone in Pakistan thought this was, you know, to asking Americans to help them against the army. I mean, uh, it's, it's a treasonable case. It's interesting that you say that it's a treasonable case because the government here is planning to file treason charges against Mansoor Ijaz as and when he comes to Pakistan, because they're saying that he's made statements in the past that, you know, he was responsible or involved in toppling Benazir Bhutto's government. Well, as I said, I, I'm just giving you what the case is. It's subjudice. There's Judicial Commission, which is now investigating. I don't know what comes out of it. But if the allegation is true, it is quite shocking, and the army has a right to be angry. Were you, were you surprised that Mansoor Ijaz did not show up for his testimony? I have, I do not have a very high opinion of Mansoor Ijaz. Um, you know, for me, he's a non-entity. I don't know why anyone took him seriously. But yet you believe the authenticity of the memo that he's claiming. No, I'm not saying that. You're not I'm saying, saying it's subjudice. Okay. I'm saying the allegation is very serious. Do you see this standoff? Because you said earlier that the age of an army takeover is over in Pakistan. Do you see the standoff subsiding? Uh, uh, no, I don't see, whatever happens, I don't see a military takeover. So how does this play out? Because you know that the world is waiting to see, and what seems is that this is a country, it's a very dangerous part of the world right now, and it's got its institutions in collision with each other. Um, I, I, I don't look at it like that. I think the worst that, w w eventually, what, what is the worst that can happen to this government? Early elections. Early elections will strengthen our democracy. As the only, my only fear is if the government demolishes the Supreme Court, which they have done, made every effort. They've bribed lawyers, they've spent, they've tried to sort of get the, the Supreme Court Bar Association pitted against the Supreme Court. They've done everything. But actually, people have stood by the, behind uh, the Supreme Court. If you look at all the opinion polls, the Supreme Court is the most respected institution in Pakistan. So people are standing behind it. And this government, in order to protect the corruption of Asa Zardari and his cronies, is now trying to demolish it. So that is, if they win, if this government wins, that's where our democracy will be destroyed. That's when I see chaos. Uh, but if there are early elections, it will only strengthen our democracy. Talk a little bit about yourself and your party. Why do you think the liberals in Pakistan dislike you? Uh, who are these liberals? I want to know because if you look at our, our rallies, it was... Uh, it is one of the most, for me, it was very satisfying because I've struggled for 15 years. But um, it was all cross sections of society. It was girls coming in jeans. It was women coming from uh, Dini Madrasas. It was Urdu medium, English medium, uh, the religious. All of them came. Uh, it's the only party in Karachi that does a rally. And all sections of society come. Uh, the Pashtuns come and the Urdu speaking come and the Balochi Sindhis. So it is a party which hopes to get all the country on one platform. The, I don't know who you talk about these liberals. I don't know these liberals because these liberals back bombing of villages. They back drone attacks. I mean, I don't call them liber liberals. I call them fascists. In my book, these people are fascists. They have, they have criticized me because I oppose this war on terror. I oppose this criminal bombing, aerial bombing of villages, women and children getting killed, and these people were applauding it. These are not liberals. Uh, these are, this is the scum of Pakistan who call themselves liberal, uh, you know, who have brought this country to the stage. Because of them, them we have uh, extremism in this country. When they look at these people who, who stand behind every American policy and, uh, which allows 
uh, this country to, uh, you know, to uh, all human rights being violated, uh, people being picked up and disappeared, and they've applauded all that. These liberals, so-called liberals, applauded the, the incineration where they bombed this mosque, where there were children and women in it, students in it, and these liberals were in the forefront. I don't call them liberals. I, th I, I agree. I really think these are the scum of this country. They call you anti-West. They've called you Taliban Khan in the past. They say you use religion uh, to mobilize masses. They're critical of the fact that, for example, you have prayed on stage during your jalsas. There has been some criticism in, in, in the Pakistani media <laughs> of that. Okay. Let's start one by one. They talk, call me anti-Western. And you're like an Oxford educated... Uh, 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 number one, uh, uh, anti-Western. Anti-Western, what is West as a geography? How can, it's like being anti-Asian, anti-Australian. What is this nonsense? Um, I have been anti the war on terror from day one. And time has proven that whatever I said has turned out to be correct. I oppose military actions. I always said there was a political solution. Today... Americans are talking to the Taliban. They've allowed an office to open in Qatar now. Yeah. They're trying to talk to the Taliban. Is that not what I was saying for eight years? For, that's why they called me pro-Taliban, because I, I oppose military action. You said there should be a dialogue with the Taliban. Number yeah. two, they um, talk about praying on stage. I pray five times a day. I mean, if I, if I only prayed on the stage and not, didn't pray normally, then they should call me, uh, you know, doing it. And, and, okay. But they're saying you're making that image no, part of your politics. No, no, but su supposing... You're but, mixing religion with politics. But, but supposing, okay, supposing I did pray on stage, am I not respecting the sentiments of my own people? I mean, I, this is a Muslim country. People, or most of the people pray here. Am I not respecting them? If I'm a politician, uh, should I sort of try and go against what are, what are the sentiments of the people of Pakistan? And, and so... And thirdly, when they say I'm using religion, I'm only in politics. If I was not spiritual, I would not be in politics. Spirituality makes you selfless. I have everything God would ever, whatever I wanted from the Almighty, I have. The only reason I've come into politics is I feel it's a responsibility because I have so much. I should try and do something for my people. Uh, I've done my, you know, build a hospital, I build a university. Um, um, uh, done a lot of work in the floods. I have a separate with building villages. But uh, should we, people like me who have everything, who ha all doors are open for me in the society, should I sit back and watch my country being plundered by criminals and take the easy option? Or should I take them on? And it's my spiritual, it's the spirituality t that tells you you should be selfless. You have, a, uh, if you, the more God gives you, the more he puts responsibility to do for the other people. Uh, and so that's why I'm in politics. It's if I, did not have, if I did not have faith in God, I would not be in politics. What about those in Pakistan and elsewhere who kill in the name of religion? You know, you describe yourself as spiritual. I remember when we were discussing your memoirs, uh, and, and your, your former wife, Jemima, was moderating your book launch in England. She actually said it was da too dangerous, she feared for your life, to ask you where you stood on the blasphemy controversy in Pakistan. And I remember you told me that you have never supported killing in the name of religion, but you accepted her argument that it's too dangerous right now in Pakistan to have a debate on this issue. Yeah. Okay, let's take one thing, one by one again. Yeah. Um, religion, if it does not make you compassionate and just, every religion, Every religion's basic message is that you become compassionate, selfless. You have to be compassionate towards other human beings. And in case of a uh, 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 Muslim, remember it's Rabbul Alameen, Lord of all human beings. It's not Rabbul Muslimin, not Lord of Muslims. So you have a responsibility as a human being to be compassionate to all human beings. So killing in the name of religion is a contradiction in terms. Number two, you have to be just. So as opposed to the animal kingdom where might is right, you have to be just in a, in a humane society. So if these two things do not come inside your heart, that means you have, it's a false religion. It's not, you're, not, you're using religion, religion for other means. And I'm talking about every religion. Now, when you talked about uh, what Jemima said, she's right. 
Pakistan society, thanks to this war on terror, is totally polarized now. One of my closest friends and one of the most enlightened Muslim uh, 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 scholars, Javed Ramdi, he is in Malaysia today. Because he had to flee. Because he cannot even talk about his religious views in Pakistan. Because such is the polarization of society. Imams of mosques have been blown up in mosques for saying simple things like suicide is un-Islamic, uh, suicide bombing is un-Islamic. So in, that, in this society, thanks to this war on terror, our participation in this war, yes, you have to be careful. You're treading a very thin line. You make one little slip and, I don't know, I said something and I had immediately a statement from Taliban condemning it. So you have to be, it's a, it's a very polarized society. The, at the moment, our efforts should be to bring everyone together. You need reconciliation in the society, not further polarization by attacking people. But aren't you worried, aren't you depressed that Pakistan's become the kind of, kind of country also where the man who killed Salman Taseer, uh, they weren't lawyers, I mean, ready to prosecute him. He was garlanded in the court. Yes, uh, the, reason, uh, the reason for this polarization is because this war on terror has spread the message that this is a war against Islam. And then, let me tell you, if Islam is threatened, there are going to be no, there's, there's going to be no limit of people willing to kill themselves for protecting their religion. So therefore, you need a different approach. And while this is depressing, what was most encouraging was my rallies. Everyone came, religious people, uh, uh, westernized people, everyone came to the rally. So therefore, there is a chance of reconcil reconciling people, getting people together on one stage. And this is really my hope that, you know, I become a bridge and get people together rather than polarize the society more. What does the ascendancy of Imran Khan mean for India? Because there are those who are concerned that you will be, if you do come to power, a hardliner. You, we've seen many references to Kashmir in your rally. And on the other hand, in India, we sort of all know you in, in the cricketing context, you have legends of fans, women still love you, and then there's the Imran Khan, the politician, who's seen as a radical, who's seen as a conservative. It's a, so much confusion. So much on, confusion. On one point here, I'm being accused of being a Jewish lobby, which is the worst you can say. Because of your marriage? Is, is it because and of it is your marriage? The, I'm yeah. on one extreme, and then a Taliban Khan on the other extreme. So this, why is this confusion? Have you, have you wondered why there is this you, so much? You tell us. What does it because mean for, for, for people in India who love you otherwise be, but are scared of your politics? Because people put people in, love people putting in stereotypes. Yeah. Because he's religious, he's righteous. Yeah. Why? Someone who's, in my opinion, someone who's religious, who's spiritual, is going to be compassionate, leftist. For me, I'm more closer to the left than the right. I mean, I, for me... Uh, you wrote in your book that you had two idols at university, Mick Jagger and Karl Marx. That's uh, quite uh, funny. In, in, in university, way. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mick Jagger and Karl Marx. And then, even now, I mean, I find sort of someone like Tariq Ali, who's, who's, who's not religious, but who's, uh, who's a leftist. I, I find my views are far closer to Tariq Ali than probably anyone else. So, so it, 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 I don't fit in that stereotype. I'm deeply spiritual. I lead my life with my faith, but I'm, I'm totally leftist in, the, in my thinking. I, should, I think I'm anti-neoliberal economics. I think it should be, there should be compassion in this world. I believe in a welfare state, uh, you know. So, so uh, they can't place me. And secondly, as far as India goes, which is your question, I do believe that there has to be a resolution on Kashmir. But I don't believe in any military solutions. I don't believe in any militancy. I believe that it should be politically, it should be done on the table and it should, there should be a political roadmap. Uh, I do believe that the Indian Army should not be there because in 20 years what it hasn't solved by six, seven hundred thousand Indian troops, it's not going to solve in the future too. I don't believe in military solutions. But are you tracking the changes, for example, on the Indian, on, on, on you know, Jammu and Kashmir, as, as, as we call it, there have been elections, there have been panchayat elections, huge turnouts, a reduction in militancy. The world has changed, and whatever you may criticize General Parvez Musharraf for, there was a four-point formula that he put on the table that seems to have become the accepted template for going forward. Well, uh, that was a positive. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. And I, I do believe that it, there, there has to be a 
political settlement and move forward. Look, there needs to be a roadmap and a political roadmap. And so the, uh, there is some sort of a political solution which, which stops this, uh, you know, this, this, this tide of extremism and, and also helping the, the righteous on both sides of the borders who exploit the situation. And, at this, and secondly, uh, I believe in a relation, normal relations, trade, everything, because really the subcontinent is suffering. Mm. We have a great opportunity. This is the fastest growing probably uh, uh, region in the world, China, India. Mm -hmm. And if Pakistan was stable and, and we had uh, a decent relationship, we lived as decent neighbors, we have a great, great uh, opportunity of lifting people out of poverty in the whole subcontinent, which should be our main concern. We should be competing in, in alleviating poverty in both countries. That should be our goal. So uh, I'm not a hardliner. Uh, I believe that you know, when, when, inshallah, government comes to power, we will have a relationship based on truth. There will be no double games. Whatever will be said, whatever will be promised will be upheld. There won't be no cloak and dagger games. Uh, and I would like that our intelligence agencies would not be operating in either countries. Neither will we be blaming uh, RAW for Balochistan, and neither would India would, would be blaming us for uh, um, our agencies for any terrorism. Would you like to see more civilian control over the ISI and the military? I think uh, a Tariq and Saaf government you will find will be different to all other governments. It will be a government which will take responsibility for everything happening in Pakistan. Tell me this, because I know you come to Mumbai often. The shadow of 2611, when we as Indians see a Hafiz Saeed saying all kinds of inflammatory things at his rallies, we see him being able to operate with impunity. What would you say to Indians? You have so many Indian friends and you, you love Mumbai. You, you've come there so often. Uh, look, Hafiz Saeed's case is in the Supreme Court. Everyone trusts the Supreme Court. People, uh, you, you look at the polls today, people are standing behind the Supreme Court. Um, I always believe in the due process of law. If anyone is accused of anything, you must put him through a, a court. I completely did not agree with this American killing of uh, uh, Osama bin Laden. I, I thought they should have dealt with him the way they dealt with Saddam Hussein, because Saddam Hussein was tried and executed. But it did not have the same martyrdom thing which Osama has had. I mean, Osama is a martyr because of the way they killed him. You think so, he's a martyr here in Pakistan? Uh, amongst various people, he's a martyr. Among, in the Muslim world, you would find amongst various people he's a martyr. The way to avoid that was to put him through a trial, accuse him. Look, civilized countries follow the due process of law. No, we're giving Ajmal Kassab a due process. Exactly. So go, the due process of law is always, it's cumbersome, but the results are always good in the bend. You actually lift... You fight these things through moral authority, not physical authority, not Guantanamo Bay, not Bagram Air Base. They, all, they only exacerbate the situation. So whatever the situation with Hafez Said should be dealt through courts. Uh, I, someone said, you know, you sent your representative in a rally where there were all the, all the religious parties were there. Of course we should send our representatives because you want to engage people. You're a political party. If you don't engage them, you marginalize them. But and does that mean you endorse them? In a way, aren't you legitimizing their very, very radical, dangerous views? Tell me, today the Americans are engaging the Taliban now. They are allowing office, as I said, open in Qatar. Yeah. They are engaging them. Uh, does that mean they are endorsing their views? I mean, this is what, this is what always should have been done. There is all, uh, you know, politicians agree, believe in political settlements. You don't believe in marginalizing people. You believe in bringing them in the mainstream. We were petrified when BJP came, came to power, that here's an extreme party. But you found the moment it came in... in a, and Vajpayee was the architect of a peace process. So they moved, in, yeah. they moved towards the center. Suddenly the rhetoric went. Uh, even if you bring these people all into the mainstream, you, the consensus, you develop a consensus where they have to come into the middle. Rather than marginalizing them and, and then the only option left is to then kill them. You send your army and you do military action and you destroy your society. Let's end by talking a little bit about you and your personal journey. From being the cricketing superstar to being seen as a playboy, party boy, to now being somebody who's spiritual, a very serious politician. Your commitment to politics has cost you personally in many ways. It cost you your marriage in many ways. You write about that quite candidly in your book. Yeah, but I, I have to say, it, 
Uh, my spirituality hasn't made me into an angel. I'm still a humble sinner. I thought you were going to say I'm still a playboy. <laughs> no, no, a humble sinner. Humble sinner. But, okay. um, but spirituality is much more than that. It changes your direction in life. From being self-orientated, being a slave of the self, you actually become free of the self. It, is the, it liberates you. It liberates you from two of the biggest uh, prisons, chains. One is self. You know, you, rather than being thinking of yourself, you become selfless. And secondly, it, it, it frees you from all your fears. No longer. It, your fears, you, the, the chain of fear, you know, that you're scared of doing things, you're scared you'll be killed, you're scared being humiliated, you break away those chains. And actually, you, you become liberated. You become a free soul. So it is actually, it, it, it is not what benefit you do to others. Inside you, you become a free soul. And so you have contentment, which is a, a, a very elusive thing. You actually have inner happiness. So in that sense, uh, Imran Khan is a, is a much more liberated person now than I was before. As far as uh, personal sacrifice, uh, you know, when, you, when you're going towards various goals, there are always uh, sacrifices you make. As a cricketer, I used to make sacrifices too. I mean, in terms of pushing myself and training. In this case, it was probably the hardest sacrifice. Or, uh, you know, God alone knows that if this wasn't politics, whether my marriage would have lasted or not. You know, it's something which we would never know. But as it turned out, my, my political life did affect my marriage. And yes, it was probably the most painful period of my life. And now your kids, you write about that in your book, growing up, in a sense, far away from you. You worry, you worry about that? That's a big cost. Well, that's why one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I was scared that they wouldn't know what I was uh, and, and they wouldn't know how I evolved into what I became and they wouldn't know anything about spirituality because sadly in Western societies you hardly see any spirituality. Now it's, the material has become so predominant and sadly also in our westernized elites in India and Pakistan we've become so material. So I wanted them to, uh, you know, have another perspective to life. You know, what is, what is religion? What is spirituality? What is Islam? What is being a human being and what should be your purpose of existence? So that's why I wrote my book my, and I had my two sons in mind because I worried that it's such a materialistic society now and, and what you've seen now, this new liberal economics, this greed, naked greed where the rich is getting, are, are getting richer and poor people are getting poorer and when the rich sort of make mistakes, poor fund them through their taxes, you know, the, the, the blunders they make. So I wanted them to have another perspective. And I really, yes, I did. I do worry about them. I wish I had more um, influence over them, you know, uh, and, and the, the, the dilemmas they face, I wish I could influence them more. But you're standing at the cusp, I think, of a big change for you, a big move forward. How confident are you in the end that you are Pakistan's future? Well, it's like when I used to step on a cricket field, I always thought I could win, you know. But you didn't, didn't always. I, didn't always. I, mean, I would get a thrashing too. But I always used to think that there's no one in this field who can beat me. Uh, I never thought this in politics until now. Now, I think that all of them put together will not be able to stop me and my tsunami. Because uh, I have total faith in people. I thought the people... as the moment they got aware, and thankfully the, the very vibrant uh, independent media in Pakistan has um, uh, raised the level of awareness, which didn't exist before. The moment they had awareness, I knew they'd rebel against the status quo. And they have. And so I think no matter what they do now, it's too late to stop us. Well, Imran Khan, as you've been saying now for a while, your time has come. Thank you so much. Pleasure to talk to you.